I'd like to introduce Felicia. Okay, and I'm supposed to follow that. <laughs> Whew. Let me just take a breath. In fact, can we all just take a breath for one sec? I came into this world a fighter. I fought to be here and I fought to stay here. My mother had seven miscarriages between my sister and I. I was the ninth baby in the womb with all of that grief and all of that anxiety and all of that despair. And the doctor said, there's no way that this kid's gonna make it, so don't get attached. But I'm here, so I did. <laughs> and when I was born, it said that, um, and this is actually after my dad's had a few martinis, but this is a great story anyway. Um, they put me in the incubator, I swung my leg over the side, and I went, whee! <laughs> like I said, a few martinis. But, but so, and then the doctor said, oh my gosh, you have a really happy baby. And I was happy for a long time. And then I turned four. So I had, <laughs> I had a few good years. <laughs> Kidding aside, um, it was, it's true though, when I turned four, everything changed. I became conscious, I became aware of what was going on in the house. And my father was the founder of the rock group Chicago. So I had a very unique childhood. Um, it was different, it wasn't normal. But again, what is really normal anyway? Um, with that, he was gone all the time. Uh, my mother was sort of left trying to create a normalcy out of dysfunction. There was alcoholism happening, there was depression happening, and here I was on the outside, this pretty little kid, you know, growing up in privilege, seeming to have the perfect uh, life. However, there was a whole nother thing going on behind the curtain. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? And there, the whole thing that was happening was as, I was growing up in severe uh, misogyny. I was growing up with all the shadow side of the music business. I was growing up not knowing that I was being preyed on. I was growing up uh, being sexualized in ways that I had no clue. I just didn't know. I came in this world of fighter, like I said. However, I also came in, my friends, I came in a lover. And when I say lover, I don't mean lover like, ooh, a lover. I don't mean like the classic sense. I mean, as a child, I had a deep sense of wonder and awe about this world, like what we've heard already this evening in these stories. There was a, a place, uh, I just had a compassion for humanity. A, a few years ago, I found a, a, a paper, uh, you know that, uh, you know the line paper you write on, you learn how to write on as a child? And it, there was a simple prayer on it, and it just said, we must pray for peace. We must pray to love everybody. We must pray to love even the people that challenge us. I was seven years old when I wrote that. Tonight, I get to share, and this is such an honor, I get to share a personal story about love. And not just any love, not the love of the love songs, which, my gosh, Chicago wrote a lot of those. Um, it's like, you know, preordestined to be like, a, a preordained to be a codependent. Um, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. Um, but, and then, not the love of, like, that's in the films, no. But I'm talking about a higher love. That is what I'm going to share my story about, is a higher love. Something very radical, because this is what changed my life. And I can't do that without first talking about violence. Because the violence is actually, the violence that I experienced is what taught me the most about that love. That's what did it, folks. So I get to share this with you tonight. And love, it has been my experience, it is messy, and it is risky, and it's bold, and it's courageous, and it's just sublime. And it is always what has been left standing in the room at the end of the day for me. So the, my life is a dedication to that love. I'd like to take us back now. 
Um, imagine I'm 15 and I'm lying in a ball on this purple carpet in my bedroom. And I'm about a year into a very abusive dynamic. I don't call it a relationship anymore. It, I thought it was at the time. And uh, it was going to go on for five years until I was 20 years old. And it was with my father's bandmate. And I was completely Stockholm syndromed out. I had no clue, like I said, that I was, I didn't know I was being abused sexually, psychologically. It was mind bending what was going on. I thought it was my fault. Classic. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't talk to anyone. I didn't have any friends. Um, I couldn't even go to a gas station. This stands out to me, and I don't know why, because it certainly isn't the worst thing that happened. I remember one time this man saying to me, who I don't know if I said this, was 20 years my senior, he said, I wish I could take a razor blade to your face, because then no one would look at you. You wouldn't be beautiful anymore. That was my life. What made this, the caveat, I should say, to this, is that because of how I was raised, uh, and the fact that I had this role as the scapegoat in the family, and that I was othered in my family. And it's all good between us now, I must add that. <laughs> that is truly one of my biggest successes in life. But I, I, I was othered in my family when, it, when they found out about this. They blamed me. They didn't blame him. I was at fault. Mm. I said to you a little while ago, I came in this life a fighter. And I don't know what I would have done if I wouldn't have been a fighter. I really don't. I don't know what would have happened to me. But I do know this, thank God I came in a lover. Thank you, goddess, because that got me through. And I would have to say it was this dynamic tension between the fire and the fighter in me and the lover, that love in me, that kept me going, it kept me alive, and it kept my heart going, even when it was gonna stop years later from anorexia nervosa. It kept my heart going, even when it was gonna stop years later from all the overdoses. My heart kept going, even with the shock treatments, even with all the in and outs of rehabs and psych visits and on and on. But this is where it gets good. At 23, <laughs> at 23, I said, you know what? I got to say yes to life. And so I began my return. I began my return back to myself, and I started saying yes to life. And the more I began to heal, the more I wanted to heal. And I relished it. I mean, this was a, it was a wonderful experience. And I began to have a sense of purpose, and a sense of meaning, and a sense of joy, and a sense of love. And I realized, oh my gosh. I want to speak, and I want to write, and I want to help people. And I was almost like that little dog in the cartoons that's like really crazed and overjoyed. I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to help people. It's going to be wonderful. And it was an exciting time. At this point, I went back to school. I decided to go back to school and study. And I watched a film called Gandhi. I had seen it when I was a kid, didn't really like it much, didn't really resonate with it. But I watched it again. And there's a scene, for those of you that might recall, where they are stepping up in lines, in rows, and they are getting hit by these batons, I believe, and Martin Sheen, who plays the reporter, goes, one by one they fell. And it's a massive moment. And I remember watching that going, oh, what is that? Here's these men in there standing in the face of violence, and they're resolute in love. They're standing in the face of violence. And so there began my journey, my experiments with love, is what I like to call it. And I became obsessed. Like, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you love your enemies? How do you really lean into this messy, radical, bold love? Let's fast forward. 2009 now. I find myself in a Palestinian village. It's the summertime. I'm with Code Pink. I'm on a peace delegation. I'm in the village of Belin, and it's Friday. It's after Juma, after prayer. And life is exceptional at this point. 
I'm, I've had years of recovery now. I'm, I'm feeling better. Um, I'm, I'm going to one of the most prestigious universities, UC Berkeley. I'm studying peace and conflict studies. And life is happy. Life is good. And so I'm coming down this pathway. And this is known to be a very, it's a nonviolent protest, but it's known to get very violent. And just months before, a Palestinian man uh, has had a tear gas canister implode in his chest, and it's killed him. One of my friends from Berkeley, a fellow activist, had part of his head blown off about a month before. And here I am in a hot pink shirt that says code pink, and I'm thinking, this is wise. <laughs> this is really smart, Felice. But I'm trained in nonviolence, and I'm ready, and I'm resolute in love. It sounds kind of scary, right? Sounds like this is a challenge. It's, it was nothing compared to what was going to happen. You must understand that nonviolence became a religion through those years of healing. It became a religion for me, and it became my way of connecting to myself, connecting to people. Except there was one thing <laughs> in the night, so to speak. There was that one person, him, and I couldn't fully let go. I couldn't fully let go of what had happened because if I forgave him, that would mean somehow forgiving the violence or letting the violence win, and I wasn't okay with that. So I had done all this other great work, and I was doing the trainings and the nonviolence and the this and the that, but no, you will not, you will not get that part of me. You will not win. Well, guess what? Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you think about, because about a week after that, that Palestinian village, uh, uh, that, that, that moment, I get an email. I'm in East Jerusalem at this point. I get an email, and it's from him. Oh, boy. I don't, I'm thinking, I'm not going to respond. And I didn't. A couple months go by. I'm now back in the States, and I'm sitting on my futon. And I think to myself, if it were me, if it were me, I would want that forgiveness. And who am I to deny anyone that, him or anybody? Who am I to deny that? So I go to my computer, and I sit down to type an email back to him. And I have every intention of maybe throwing a zinger or two, you know, a little victimhood, and kind of calling him out. And I can't do it. I can't do it. And what comes out of me is, thank you. Thank you. Because of the experiences that happened between us, I have yet to do this work of love today. Thank you. Love. It isn't what we always think it's going to be. It doesn't always look like what we want it to look like. In my life, it has been a force field. Richard Rohr often calls it a force field. It has been a force field of healing and of connection. And it is always, it has never let me down, whether it's been a whisper or a roar. Roar, I have heard it saying to me, whether it was in, in my room at night or in a crowded theater, I got you. I got you. I'd like to share something that I wrote. I'm a, I'm a pastor, but I'm heretical at times, <laughs> because I can be. And um, so I decided I'd write the love chapter in the Bible, <laughs> 1 Corinthians 13. So check this out. I'd like to share this. I'll close with this. Love is patient. This is what I have to say. Love is impatient, knocking on your door when you least expect it, waiting for you to answer, saying, hurry up, we don't have all day. Love is kind. Well, sometimes, but it can be brutal. It can turn you inside out, pushing you beyond what you think you are able. Love, it does not boast. It is not proud. Again, love is loud. It roars, as it should, from the mountaintop, demanding to be seen, to be heard, to be witnessed, and to be joined. It is love that is our noble leader calling us to it. Love does not dishonor others. No, it doesn't, but it will not stand for shame either, nor injustice, nor flagrant repose in the face of violence. 
Love will become the warrior leading the charge of impenetrable discernment. Love is not self-seeking. It is only in the face of God that it stops seeking, for it is forever sought. And love is not easily angered. When turned away, love will burn you like the sun. The fire and scorching the apathetic, the blaze waking up those that sleep. My friends, tonight we are woke, yes? Yes. Love has woken us up and it is roaring to us. And what is it calling for you to do? Is it calling for you to, to create something, to create a vision for a better world? Because we need that right now, don't we? Is it calling for you to fall more deeply in love with yourself than you ever have? What is it calling to do? What is that thing? You know what it is. I posit that question to you. And do you hear it? It's roaring. It's saying to us right now, in this moment, I got you. Thank you.